morning, everybody, and happy Father's Day to all the fathers that are listening or here with us. Um, we just want to welcome you to Identity Church this morning, and we'd love for you to connect with us. You can use this QR code that's up here on the screen, and that will take you to our website, and there's all sorts of fun things for you to look at, <laughs> and um, just ways for you to get connected with us. Cigar Church, this is something that uh, Clay and Dan and their friend Steve do. Um, it airs every Friday at 8 p.m. on YouTube. They talk about cigars and they talk about Jesus. So if you like either of those, you should watch it. If you are wanting to yeah, give an offering today, um, you can text an amount to the 84321, or you can go online to our website, uh, <laughs> um, and you can give there. And if you are here in person, we also have a black box in the back um, that you can put your offering in, and we will all look away while you do it so nobody knows what you're doing. <laughs> Don't use this bathroom. Use the one upstairs, just because we said so. And, of course, at the end of the sermon, we will have our overtime discussion. We invite you to stick around and join us for that. If you are online, sorry, you don't get to be a part of that. But <laughs> Hello. Woo. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Is that it? Okay. All right. We're going to pray you in, and then the boys are going to sing us out. <laughs> God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for giving us uh, friends that we can be silly with and a church family that lets us do those things. Um, we pray that you would uh, come into this time, um, that you would bless the boys while they do music for us, that you would bless Clay while he is speaking for us, and that you would open all of our hearts to hear what you have to say this morning. God, we ask that everyone is safe during their Father's Day um, festivities, and that anyone who doesn't have a great relationship with their father would have someone that they can connect to today. And may that be you. In your name we pray. Amen. All is stripped away, and I simply come. i just to bring something that's a much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my A song in itself 
is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship When it's all about I'm sorry, love, for the thing I made. 
God, we thank you for being holy. We thank you for being a God that has revealed yourself to us through the person of Jesus Christ. God, today as we dig into your word, let it be real to us. Let us understand it. Let us know exactly what you want us to do with it in Christ's name. Amen. Wow, my foot squealed. That's cool. Hey, happy Father's Day. Um, as I've already had a few people ask, that was not a picture of me grilling um, before I had my beard. Um, I don't need that, but thanks, babe. Um, my wife's back there looking out for me. Um, but yeah, happy Father's Day to you guys that are dads in the room. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, you guys are awesome. Uh, I know a few of you as in the capacity of being a father and uh, especially one, I mean, it's, he is my father. So, uh, but happy Father's Day. It's a, it's a cool day. It's a good day. Hopefully you get to enjoy it and spend some time uh, with your families. If not, uh, you know, sorry. Um, that's all I got for you. Um, it was good to have the ladies do the, the welcome this morning. Um, there's more energy in our welcome than ever before, so I'm excited about that. Um, but here's the deal. This text we're looking at today, we're going to feed off of last week's text and go into just one more verse because this next verse packs a wallop when you add it to the other verses. And here's what I want you to get, all right? Um, I want you to notice one specific word, or maybe a phrase depending on how your Bible translates it, but the idea of triumph, triumph, all right? Let's look at the text, and then we're going to jump right in because this is, this is a lot to unpack. So let's look at our Colossians text. It says this. This is what we read last week, and we'll add the verse on to the end of it. It says, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailed you to the cross. That's where we stopped last week. Here is what is added to it. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Leave that one up there for me, Jennifer. Um, do you catch the importance of the word triumph? Triumphing over them by what Jesus did on the cross. I want to unpack that for just a second before we really look at this text because you and I don't get the same emotional response that the Jewish person, the Greek person, the Roman person would have when Paul wrote this. There was this practice back in the Roman days, and it's a bit, <laughs> there's a little bit of me that goes, I wish we would do this again. But when the, the Roman generals, when the Roman emperor would go off to war, they would go and, and, and battle whoever it was. They would go and defend a town or whatever they were doing. When they would come back from that battle, um, a lot of times they would have a parade of sorts through the streets of Rome showcasing their victory. If you've ever been over Rome, I haven't been there, but I've seen pictures. They have the, these arches all over the place that, were, that are... are um, uh, just memorials that signify these different triumphs that they had over the years. Uh, and, and the whole point of that was you would walk the army, the victorious army, through these arches and down these roads, and, and the Roman citizens would cheer, and the Romans would just, they, they, they ate it up. They loved it, and it was just this big party celebrating how great we are as Romans. That they are, as I'm not Roman. But what was really cool about it, what was really powerful about it, was that not only would the victorious people walk through the streets, they would have in tow the losers. So the generals and the, the emperor and all of them coming in victorious, probably dented up armor and all that kind of stuff, just chest puffed out, excited that they're greeting their family and their friends. We won, we won. And behind them is the losing team. 
Could you imagine? I, I, I got really excited in 2022. I tried to make it to it when my Astros won the World Series. Hate on them if you want to. That's fine. But the, do you, anytime your team wins the World Series or the Super Bowl or the NBA Finals or whatever, you know, they, they bring them in on these, these buses and they're standing on top of these, these you know, uh, uh, two-story buses or whatever and they're parading everybody through town. Could you imagine if the losing team, like, I, I, you know, let's just say, you know, when Boston's celebrating their victory, have they won it yet? Uh, the NBA Finals, they're going to destroy them. But anyways, as Boston is, is celebrating in Boston, if the Dallas Mavericks have to be like in a clown car behind them, you know, just with their heads down, that's what the Romans did. They would bring in the, the king of the country they conquered. They would bring in their generals. Sometimes they would strip them naked. Sometimes they would bring him in with the arrows still in him. Their death walk through the streets. And that's, that's a little gory. That's a little vicious. I get it. But think about just the, the totality of a victory. The totality of a victory when in front of your people you can say, you see him? I whooped him. I beat that army. We won. We conquered that army. Let me read this again for you. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them. In the Greek, the word there is for the idea of triumphs, which is what those marches were. So what Paul is telling the Colossian people is that Jesus, that you are following, is so victorious over the world so victorious over these powers and these authorities and as you remember as we talked about it that that's all powers and authorities he even specifies it's a big word uh he specifies that the the powers and authorities that he's talking about are those in heavenly realms the spiritual powers and authorities but also in earthly realms the earthly powers and authorities and he's saying that jesus was so spectacularly triumphant over them that he made a public spectacle of them. He triumphed with them, like walked them through the city, made it very public that he won. And the question has to come up in our head, how? How did Jesus make a public spectacle of him? Because what Paul says is the way they did it is he triumphed over them by the cross. What did Jesus do on the cross? Well, we, we know that Jesus had little to no control over his physical body when he was arrested and beaten and put in a mock trial and walked down the street with all of his wounds carrying a cross as if he's the loser in a triumph march and taken to the hill and put on the cross and, and, and has no control over physically being there. He was even mocked and, and they even said that, that if you're this God that you say you are, then command thousands of angels and they'll come and take you off of this cross. And yes, he had the ability to do that, but he didn't. How is this triumphant? I'm going to give you two things I want you to, 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 when you hear this text, I want you to pin them in your mind to this text. There's two ways that Jesus triumphed over the powers of this world, the powers and authorities in the spiritual world, and made a public spectacle of them. The first one is this, and we're going to talk about the, the spiritual side of it. He triumphed over Satan. Here's why. We see in Scripture that Satan, the word Satan actually means the accuser. Have you ever felt accused have you ever felt, maybe just in yourself, maybe when you're just at home, maybe when you're laying in bed with the lights out and you're trying to sleep, and all of those horrible things that you've done in your life, all of those lies you've told, all of the people you've hurt, all of the, the things that you've done in this world that is just damaging to your soul and to the people around you, they're just ringing in your head over and over and over and over again. That is the accuser pointing his finger at you, accusing you of evil, saying you are an evil person. But the way that Jesus made a public spectacle and triumphed over that, that's when he hung on the cross, every single one of those things that Satan is pointing at 
you and saying, this is who you are. This is your identity. This is the mistakes you made. Every single one of those, Jesus took on himself on the cross. I want you to process that for just a second. Because I know this. I know this is a fact about at least one other person in this room other than me. It doesn't matter how good you've lived your life. There's something eating at you. There's something in the back of your head that you wish you could have undone the second it came out of your mouth, the second you did it, the second you acted on that emotion, the second whatever. That accusation, no matter how horrible or how light, no matter what, no matter what you have done, Jesus defeated it. Jesus conquered it. He triumphed over it. And he said, if you follow me, that sin no longer defines you. It is on the cross, and it's dealt with, and it's done away with. And he made a public spectacle of it on his shoulders so that you may be forgiven. That's the story of Jesus' triumph. The second one is this. This is the other way that he made it a public spectacle. And this is in the physical. You ready for this? There's so often that as followers of Jesus, we struggle as to how do we interact in this world that isn't, isn't friendly to the message of Jesus anymore. It's a political season. We've got an election coming up. There's two polar opposite candidates that's going to potentially, I don't, I mean, it's, here's the, this presidential campaign is about to become a mess. You got one that's been convicted as a felon now that who knows where that even legally stands with what he can and can't do on the ballot. You've got one that is really struggling with his cognitive abilities and they're already talking about, can we put him on the ballot? Right now we're thinking it's one of those two guys. It may be two totally different people. We don't know. And that's how crazy our season is this year. But here's what Jesus did on the cross. He declared and he triumphed over all powers all authority, spiritual, the accuser, and physical, the president, the government, the king and queen in another country, whatever. And what that tells us is no matter where you live, no matter what regime is in control, no matter which president is elected, you have a king over you named Jesus Christ that has bought you with a price, who has erased all of your transgressions, who has forgiven every single thing and has stood behind you and said, this person is mine, and you have the ability to stand tall and say, no matter what happens in this world, I know that my king is victorious. I don't know who you're going to vote for this year. It's your business, not mine. But there's probably about half the people in the room that their person's not going to get voted in this year. And the other half is going to say, oh, yeah, my guy won. All of us can stand firm together and say we serve the king that has conquered all powers and authorities, that is in charge of all things, that gives us our identity in him, not in divisive politics, not in country of origin. None of that's wrong. Just when you put it before your identity in Christ, it gets out of place. Jesus has conquered all power and authority. And he made a spectacle of them and said that because of what I have done, my people are victorious in me. We're coming into a season here pretty soon. Fourth of July is a few weeks away. One of my favorite times of the year where we get to talk about freedom and we get to talk about what it means to be a follower of Christ. And because of what Jesus did, we have freedom in this world to stand victorious with him. There's one more text I want us to see written by Paul as well. It says this, since the children have flesh and blood, that's talking about us, he too shared in the humanity, talking about Jesus coming and being human himself, so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free those 
uh, who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. This is the last thing I want you to get, that Jesus is triumphant over. In this physical realm, the number one fear is the fear of dying, the fear of death. I don't know if you call it a privilege, but I had the privilege to sit with two different men. In, well, I, I've had this, this has happened more than twice, but two men that um, were, were on their deathbed, or so I thought in the moment. One was a man, I'm, I'm not going to use either one's names, uh, but one was a man who was in the church we were at at the time, very, very highly viewed as, a, as one of the most godly men in the church. Uh, was a man of prayer, a gentle man, a, a very wise man. He was up in age, and he had gotten an infection that, that made him deathly sick, and he had lost tons of weight. He was bedridden in the hospital. Uh, he was in a lot of pain, and we began talking with the doctors, and, and it became very clear that, that if this didn't get resolved in the next 24 or 48 hours, this man was going to pass. I went and prayed with him and, and sat in his room with him, and and as tears streamed down both of our faces, he got very emotional. He grabbed a hold of my arm with what little strength he had left. And he said, Clay, don't let them let me die. They've got, to, they've got to save me. They've got to save me. And he just was panicking about dying. This very godly man was terrified of death. Not but about six months later, I went and visited a friend of mine who is about the same age, has lived a, lived a completely different life, um, a womanizer, a foul-mouthed, crazy guy that just, I mean, two totally different lives. And I went and sat with him in the hospital, and he's had cancer and has a tumor in his stomach that's bigger than, than his stomach just about and has gone through all kinds of stuff, and we thought for sure he was going to die. And I sat with him, and I told him, I said, man, I, I just want you to know that, that I love you, and I, I want what's best for you. I said, can we talk about what the future holds if you pass away, what, what, what there is after this life? And I walked him through the gospel message, and he said, Clay, I've, I've always believed in Jesus, but I've never put my faith in Jesus. And I said, well, let's do that. And we prayed, and we talked, and the guy was so weak, he couldn't even get out of bed. Uh, you know, some of our good restoration movement buddies will say, well, you've got to get him baptized. I know this man has faith. I'm not worried about his salvation. And we talked, and we prayed, and, and I left him, and I said, you know what? I want you to know something before I leave. Whatever happens here, I want you to feel confident that when this life is over, you know you have salvation through Jesus Christ. And he said, I did. And he said, if I don't ever get out of this bed, I, I, I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied, was the word he said. And I remember thinking, here's a man who spent his entire life in the church, a man who should have had the confidence that the Savior he has served has conquered death and has beaten this thing and has been triumphant over it, and he shares in that triumph, of that, that victory. He shares in that moment, and he just couldn't grasp it. And then here's this man who within minutes of his potential death said, yes, I want to put my faith in Jesus. And he knew that he was triumphant with Jesus. Neither one died. Both are still with us right now. And I pray that God is working on both of them. That was multiple years ago too, by the way. Both of them are still with us. Both of them are still wrestling with God in their faith. And I hope God has given both of them the feeling of triumph over death. But here's the thing. Following Jesus makes you triumphant with him. When that public spectacle of Jesus walking through the streets, triumphant over death, triumphant over the accuser, guess what? You're in that parade too, but as victorious, not as defeated. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your victory. Thank you for what you have done. Thank you for making a public spectacle of the accuser and of death. God, we just pray that as we share in your victory that we will be confident, that we will know your heart, that we will know what you have for us, that we will walk behind you and with you with our chest held out and our head held high saying that this man won the victory for us. God, we thank you for that. In Christ's name, amen. The band's going to do a couple more songs. Um, in the back of the room, there's communion. Um, that communion, especially when we talk about the cross in this way, that communion 
holds a, a special, a special uh, purpose in our service. You see, in any battle, there's bloodshed. In any battle, bodies are wounded. And in this battle, and even though Christ was victorious, he shed his blood and his body was given for us. And that's what the juice and the bread back there stand for. Um, if you'd like to take communion today, it's here. Um, if you want to engage with Jesus in that way and be a part of that and, and remember his sacrifice for us, it is here for you to take. Um, also on the backboard behind us on the whiskey barrel is a place for prayer requests. I know in a group like this, we've got a lot that needs to be prayed for. There's cards there. Write down your prayer request. Stick it on that board, and we'll pray for it this week. I'm going to be back over here behind Dan and the soundboard. Uh, if anybody needs to talk, if anybody needs prayer, uh, I'll be there to pray for you guys. Uh, but during these next two songs, please engage in that way.
God, this is your world, and we are blessed to be in it. Um, as we leave here today, Lord, let, uh, let us go into the world and, and stand as victorious with you um, so that the world may see you, so that they may know you, so that they can have confidence in approach, approaching you because you are victorious. In Christ's name, amen. We're going to take a five-minute break um, and come right back here to do our overtime discussion. Uh, I'll give you some more instructions on that when we come back, but it's a 12-minute discussion that you could ask whatever question you want to ask, and we will answer it to the best of our ability. Uh, so take about five minutes, and we'll see you for overtime.